Well, we're continuing to have people check in this morning for our class from 21 Indispensable Qualities of a Leader by John Maxwell. Um, hopefully we will have a good turnout again on this Monday. While people are checking in, I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll to ask an introductory question, and those that are logging in will see it next. Just a, a point of interest here, which of these books on positive attitude have you ever read before? And I, and I just looked up the top selling books on positive attitude, just to see what uh, some in this class might be familiar with. Uh, from the bottom up, it's uh, Leading with Gratitude, Eight Leadership Practices for Great Business Results, uh, The Power of Faith and Positive Thinking, uh, by Moore, and that's a fairly recent book. I, I think that was, uh, that's um, maybe been 10, 10 or 15 years ago. The uh, Energy Bus, 10 Rules to Fuel Your Life, Work, and Team with Positive Energy. And you can mark more than one of these if you're an avid reader and you've read more than one. How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie, also one of the top selling books on positive attitude. The Happiness Advantage uh, by Sean Anker, or Acker, I think. Uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and It's All Small Stuff. Simple Ways to Keep Little Things from Taking Over Your Life. Wow, that is a long title, isn't it, from Carlson? But again, uh, one of the top selling books on positive attitude. And then actually the number one top selling book of all time on positive attitude is The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. I, I don't know when that was written, uh, decades ago. I don't, maybe that celebrated a 50th anniversary perhaps. I mean, it's, an, it's been around for a long time. So just if you have read any of those books, let us know which ones. And we will uh, start here in just one minute as other people check in. Good to see so many of you join us today on this uh, Monday. It's a bit gloomy here in the Republic, Missouri area. Lack of sunshine can affect my positive outlook for sure. But looking forward to a presentation today on that topic of positive attitude. I'll give just a couple of more minutes for those of you that have just tuned in today. There's a poll up asking which of these positive attitude books you have read in the past. And we still have people checking in too. So give just a few more moments. All right, actually I'm going to share those results and you could look at, the, look at those as I introduce our guest today. Our guest speaker on the topic of positive attitude is Dr. Pam Dutzman. Now Pam is a great co-worker and I say great because she is uh, reliable and she does great work, uh, responsible, and she is the County Engagement Specialist in Christian County. Uh, she's been working in the community development area for several years now. She first joined uh, Extension uh, in nutrition years ago, and then she, uh, uh, she went and earned a master's and a PhD from Iowa State University, uh, but we try not to hold that against her. And then she also worked as a regional director for uh, the American Cancer Society and as a nutritionist at Mercy or St. John's Health Systems at the time, and then she uh, was also director of the Food Nutrition Education Program, or the Family Nutrition Education Program here in Southwest Missouri with MU Extension. She now works in the area of community development, and today she'll be talking with us about the characteristic or the indispensable quality of a positive attitude. And Pam, it looks like people that are uh, participating today have some knowledge of that subject. Uh, uh, 11 of them looks like they've read The Power of Positive Thinking and 13 have read Don't Sweat, Sweat the Small Stuff. So 
you have an audience today with a bit of a working knowledge. All that hands is on great. You. Thank you so much, David. I agree with David. There is a lot of material out there. As I've spent um, the last, uh, actually, couple weeks trying to read about this whenever I got a chance and do some research, the problem was really um, in a good way finding lots of great material out there. So I ended up just coming back to the book and we're going to follow the outline of how he did his chapter, how Maxwell did his chapter today. And so David, if you could go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint, we can get started with that. <clears throat> yes. Hopefully that's visible now. Yes, it is. Um, you could go on to the second slide. I did want to start out with uh, one of the studies I did come across, which I thought was very interesting. And according to a study published in Science Advances in 2016, 90% of the population can be classified into four basic personality types. And I thought this was interesting because it's different than what I have heard before. Uh, the personality types are optimistic, pessimistic, trusting, and envious. And so right off the bat, I'd like to have a poll. And David, if you could put up that poll, we'd like to ask each of you, which personality type do you think they found was the most common when they did this study? Which personality type do you think was the most common? Pam, I don't even get to vote, but I'm not sure I could even hazard a guess. Uh, sometimes it depends on the day of the week. <laughs> yes, well, some of the personality um, instruments that are used out there like Myers-Briggs and things, they do use, you know, optimistic or pessimistic as part of a personality assessment. I had not seen trusting and envious before. Okay, it looks like most people think um, pessimism is the, is the highest. And that's what I went into this thinking as well. I, I thought that would be the highest. All right, well, let's close that. <clears throat> and this study from Spain actually found that the majority of people fall into envious. Envious was the most common with 30% compared to 20% for each of the other groups. So the other groups tied um, at 20%, but they found those people who were envious, they don't have a positive outlook because they're constantly comparing themselves to others. And <clears throat> they don't want really others to around them to really succeed because they might look bad if that happens. And they even may go as far as to sabotage a project to see it fail if they don't get, if they're not going to get credit for the success. So as I was reading through that study, I was thinking if this is true, and I don't, I couldn't find other studies who had validated that study, but I thought this was an interesting thing just to think about. If 30% of our population truly is like that, that's pretty scary. Um, because those would mean those are our majority of our co-workers and the people around us. But in this study, the optimists hoped for the best, and that's what we would expect. The pessimists routinely demonstrated that really they were driven by their extreme aversion to risk. They were just, you know, driven by that more than anything. But the trustfuls were the most altruistic of all the groups. Um, and it turns out that they chose cooperation with others um, without even caring if they won or, or lost. They didn't even care really about that. They were much more altruistic and, and all about the team and all about others. So this was really interesting to read about. And um, I think that both the pessimists and the envious could probably relate to this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. Reality continues to ruin my life. And while that makes for a humorous quote, um, I think most of us do know that it's not really a recipe for successful living. Um, and so in the chapter today, John Maxwell, he shows us that being a leader with a positive attitude is a lot more than a personality type. And that no matter what our personality type, we can learn to improve this skill. 
David, could you go to the next slide, please? And I came across a lot of quotes and, and I hesitated to put any because they were just so many that were really good. But some famous quotes, uh, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. And that's Winston Churchill. And then Abraham Lincoln said, we can complain because rose bushes have thorns or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. Now, I'm not really able to see the screen, but uh, Valerie says that that study was in Spain and that might be cultural and that is true. That's a good, that's a good point. Um, the next um, quote was the optimist sees the donut and the pessimist sees the hole. And that's Oscar Wilde. Um, but I read so much during this session and one of the things that I came across reminded me of something that made an impact on me several years ago. It's been it's been years that I, ago that I read Good to Great by Jim Collins, and I had forgotten some of the rich things that are in that book. But he talks in that book about something called the Stockdale Paradox. And if we could go to the next slide, I'd like to talk about that. The Stockdale Paradox is named after Admiral Jim Stockdale, who was a US military officer held captive for eight years during the Vietnam War. And Stockdale was, uh, he was tortured over 20 times by his captors, and he really never had much reason to ever think he was going to survive and return home. But he revealed later that he did not ever lose his faith. He, this is a quote from him. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn this, this experience into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. So after he's out, he's saying he wouldn't trade that experience. That to me is a remarkable statement. That's eight years of your life. But the paradox was this. Stockdale said that it was the most optimistic of his prison mates that failed to make it out of their alive. And that was surprising to me. He said, and this is a quote, they were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas and Christmas would come and Christmas would go. And then they'd say, we're going to be out by Easter, and Easter would come, and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving, and then it would be Christmas again. And Stockdale said that they died of a broken heart because they failed to confront the reality of their situation. And so Stockdale approached adversity with a really different kind of mindset. He accepted the reality of his situation. He didn't bury his head in the sand, but he looked for every single way he could to lift the morale of his fellow prisoners and prolong their lives. And he became famous for the saying on this slide, you must retain faith that you will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties. And at the same time, you must confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. So if you could go to the next slide, David. <laughs> That is fascinating, Pam, and relevant. It's, it's a very good story. It's, it's a very good story. And um, the story really spoke to me right now, maybe, maybe more even because of the last six weeks, six to eight weeks we've been living in, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we kind of are realizing that this is not a drill. Um, we've kind of practiced our leadership skills and positive attitude skills for days like we have been living. And, you know, knowing that life is, is a journey, you know, we're not going to maybe ever have anything like happen to Admiral Stockdale. But we do know that life's going to be a journey of lots of ups and downs and even sometimes really extreme hardships. But the only way to travel that successfully is going to be to hold on to really positive hope like Admiral Stockdale talked about while also understanding and respecting the realities of our current situation. And I think that's where we are right now with the COVID-19, and I thought we could all relate to that story. David, if you go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> not, not the one with the plan? Uh, no, the next slide with uh, Thomas Edison. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, there we go. No, you're good. Um, so Thomas Edison, uh, Maxwell talks about him and gives him as an example in his chapter. Uh, Thomas Edison said that genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. 
But in our chapter, Maxwell stated that he believes Edison's success was due to a third factor, and that was positive attitude. Um, and I, it just so happens that I read a biography of Edison last year, and I learned a lot. I thought I knew a lot about Thomas Edison, but it was very fascinating. And one of the things that I found about him, it was all about putting one foot in front of the other every day. He just kept going, no matter what the obstacles were. He just kept moving forward with hope. And one of the points that Maxwell makes when he's talking about this is that the leaders that are going to achieve lasting success are the ones that are going to possess that positive attitude, which not only gives us that inner sense of contentment, but it also inter it impacts those people who are around us. And, and it impacts how they interact with us. And we're going to see that more as we go through this. Okay, the next slide, please. All right, so to learn more about what it means to be positive, Maxwell then says to think on these things. And he lists four things to think about, so four principles. He says, first is, attitude is your choice. And he gives an example of Viktor Frankl, who survived imprisonment in a, in a Nazi death camp. <clears throat> and after he gained his freedom, he wrote a famous book called Man's Search for Meaning. And, it, and in that book, he tells the story of how he survived the Holocaust by finding personal meaning in his experience. And he says that gave him the will to live through it. He went on to later establish a whole field of psychology based on that. And the underlying motivator um, in life, he says, is the will to find meaning, even in the most difficult of circumstances. So this slide contains some great quotes by Viktor Frankl. He says, when we're no longer able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves. And everything, <clears throat> everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Okay, David, okay, the next slide. Um, so this is a great picture. I had to include this because this is the, the first day of kindergarten. And I actually started collecting these a few years back. I have a whole bunch of these. But it just illustrates that we cannot always have a good day, right? She's, she's off to, the, to school in the morning, and you can see how different she looks when she comes home. And this is the same day, same outfit, that she, she's lost her coat, and who knows what else has happened to her. Um, so no matter how hopeful we are about it or how prepared we are, we're going to face bad days. And, you know, the thing is that no matter how hard we try to avoid it, we're going we're gonna to fail. We all are. We're going to have failures. And we have to choose how we're going to react to that. So it's the attitude that we choose to adopt that will determine our next steps and how others will choose to follow us. And the next slide, it's important to remember that we cannot control the attitude of others because the mom wrote a note encouraging Julian to have a great day. She says, Julian, have a great day, love mom. And before she went, she said, I will not. So she was having none of it. And I think we all can see that um, we know that we really can't control other people's attitude. We can only control our own. Okay, the next slide, please. So Stephen Covey wrote the 90-10 principle in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And this principle states that 10% of life is made up of what happens to us and 90% of life is decided by how we react. So we really have no control over so many things that happen to us. You know, we can't stop the car from breaking down or the plane from arriving late or, you know, the driver that cuts us off in traffic or... For me, it's the red light that lasts three minutes long, right? That's about the time I start losing it. But we do control our reaction to those things. And that before we freak out, and we know that once we freak out, it's hard to ever get that back, right? We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But before we freak out, taking a moment to stop and breathe and count to 10 or count to 100 if you need to do that. But do what is needed not to let those negative emotions carry us away. We do have control over that. Maxwell says, don't let your circumstances dictate the way you choose to think. It's your attitude that determines your actions. And that's the basis for his next point. And if you could go to that screen, David. He says that it's not what we feel that should determine the way we act and behave. He says, 
the positive person, <clears throat> we don't have to be born gifted with that. We don't have to have a high IQ or a talent, a special talent. It's really uh, about the attitude, not our aptitude. Our attitude, not our aptitude. And our attitude is really crucial because it determines how we will act and our actions determine our accomplishments. And then the principle three on the next slide is our attitude is like a mirror. And you know, the attitude we give out is gonna be the same attitude we're gonna get back. And I think we forget this a lot of times that our attitude is really catching. That, you know, that old saying that misery loves company, we're gonna attract the kind of people, if we're going around being miserable all the time, those are the kind of folks that are gonna be attracted to us. And being miserable really doesn't attract good things, does it? It's just gonna attract more negativity. So this idea of like attracts like, you know, and so sometimes we say, I just deserve to have a bad day, I'm gonna be grumpy. We have to realize there will be consequences to that. It's gonna affect the people around us and it's gonna affect what comes back to us. We tend to get what we get. Okay, the next slide, David. And then principle four, as Maxwell laid it out, is that no matter what difficulty we encounter, and we kind of alluded to this a couple minutes ago, maintaining the right attitude will always be much easier than regaining the right attitude. And so that's his fourth point. And so as soon as we sense our attitude going south, it's really important then to make that adjustment. And you know, this takes discipline, it takes intentionality. We have to stop and think um, to control our thoughts and emotions. But we are in the driver's seat with our emotions. We can't let our emotions drive us. So misery and negativity, those are always gonna be an option. We can always be miserable, we can always be negative, that's gonna be the easy way. But in that moment to choose to be positive, it takes work, it takes, it takes discipline, but it will become easier over time. And that's what I like about where he goes next. He goes next to how to keep our attitude positive. And I ran across this, this picture, I thought it was just so good because it, it reminded me about that seven to one ratio rule, you know, that everyone's heard about that every negative encounter, there should be a minimum of seven positive ones to counterbalance the effects of the first one, right? And actually research does bear that out. I tried to find all the articles I could on this and it, it's true that research bears it out, although the ratio differs kind of depending on which research article I read. But the point is that it's a lot easier to think negatively than positively. And it's really important how we talk to ourselves. I came across this quote, our self-talk is the seedbed to our conversations with those that we influence for better or worse. And so the loudest and most influential voice we're gonna have is the one that's inside of our heads. And that voice can work against us or for us. It can cheer us on or wear us down, depending what we allow it to do but we can, in, we can control it because we're the sender and we're the receiver, right? We're, we're in control on both ends of that. And so if we consciously take control of that, Maxwell's advice is every time we have a negative thought, take it, reframe it, and replace it with a positive word or phrase. And that will take possibly writing those phrases down because maybe they're not natural for us to remember. So if you have a common thing you say to yourself, like I do sometimes, you're an idiot. You know, I say that to myself sometimes. I have to write down something more positive so that I can actually see it and re read it back to myself. See, I would never call someone else an idiot, but I think we all have much harsh, harsher words for ourselves in our head sometimes. Okay, David, would you go to the next screen? All right, so just take one second, if you would, and I want everyone to close their eyes and picture in their mind a flying elephant. Picture an elephant with wings. Okay, David, will you go to the next slide? Now, if you will close your eyes and picture a purple alien, an alien that is purple. Picture that in your head. And then one more image on the next slide, I want you to picture a hippo wearing a tutu. A hippopotamus wearing a tutu. And get that in your head. 
Okay, let's go to the next slide, David. This is a really simple exercise. So most of us likely pictured something like this in our minds, right? Just a very simple experiment to show we control what we have in our minds. We control what we think. And if we were in a room together, we would do a larger exercise about this, how we can actually just simply by having people stop in the middle of anything that's going on and think about an image or something, an idea, that they, their thoughts go to that and they can actually change what is in their head. So this technique is used with counselors who um, try to get people who are really negative to try to think more positive thoughts when they say, oh, I can't, I have no control over my mind. Well, we all do have control over what we put in our mind. And David, the very next slide talks about Maxwell's second tip to improve our attitude, which is to achieve a goal every day, even if it's something really small. If we set really small attainable goals, you know, like we reinforce that pattern of I think I can, I think I can, like this little engine that could. I, I read this when I was little over and over. I don't know if you all did. It's a very famous book. But it's all about just those reminders that when we set a pattern of, of actually achieving these small goals that we set, no matter how small, they kind of develop a pattern of positive thinking because every day we can mark something off that we did do. And so that's his second tip to improve our attitude. And then the third tip and the third and final tip is to write on your wall. And so he talks about that in his chapter and put up reminders of positivity everywhere. So start the morning strong by having something that you see right away when you get out of bed and you read, you know, put it on your bathroom mirror, in your work area, on the visor of your car. Keep your thoughts positive, just putting up quotes and pictures of things we love, people we love, inspirational posters, whatever will bring us positive, supportive thoughts and feed ourselves the right food. And then this image with the tree says, your mind is a garden, your thoughts are the seeds. You can grow flowers or you can grow weeds. So I thought that was good. And I couldn't resist this very last slide, um, which shows a virus. That's what that is. And basically just leaving it with, with our attitudes are contagious and reminding us that as leaders, we need to make sure that our attitude is worth catching. And that is all I've got today. Pam, I generally think of you as a pretty positive person, and I know well, you. Thank you. I know you uh, practice gratitude, uh, gr having an attitude of gratitude. Are there some things in your own life that you found to be effective for developing this positive approach? Yes, actually, um, I'm not normally a positive person at all, and um, and in fact, I come from a family who who is not positive thinkers. So, but it is something that I've always wanted to change. And about six or seven years ago, um, I read a book about um, just how to change your attitude by being grateful. And I started a gratitude journal and um, it's just remarkable. And then I was very interested because it was very powerful in changing the way I thought each day, every day waking up and thinking of two or three things that I was grateful for and making sure that I meditated on that and wrote that down and was thankful for that. And then um, I started looking into the research and there's a lot of really strong research about this. And um, it turns out that uh, what the research says is that the most powerful way to change our attitude toward a positive attitude is to be grateful and to practice gratitude. And so I would, I would highly recommend that. I have a long way to go. It's something I think I'll always have to be very intentional about. It's not a, it's not a natural gift for me at all. I have a very analytical mind. I, send, I tend to see the red flags first. So I have to stop myself and think differently and to see the possibilities. So, but I think, I think it for sure, I believe it can be done for anyone. And if I could do it, I think anyone can, so. So it's a conscientious effort. Yes, daily, I think. I, the uh, TED talk that we shared out, I found, you know, fascinating uh, in that it really, demonstrates how our attitude can be contagious. Yes. And then once we pass it on to somebody else, it's kind of, it's hard to get them to change the way they see the issue, whether positive or negative. And in her talk, you know, the negative seems to be the stronger pull. So, um, right. 
I mean, that certainly uh, puts emphasis on the importance of us as leaders having a positive attitude. And something that, uh, I don't know, it just made me think about that again and how I say things and what I say, the, imp the long term impact of that on any sort of project or situation. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just so critical. It, um, and, and not allowing, you know, the, really everything that Maxwell said, I just totally agree with not allowing ourselves because we may be sometimes the only person willing to think positively in a given situation. But if we want to be that leader um, and be that example and be the person who, who starts changing that, we have to stand strong. We can't give into that negativity even one time. We really have to remain positive through whatever it is. And it doesn't mean like, you know, putting our fingers in our ears and, and not listening, like what we said with the Stockdale paradox. Um, I think it starts with acknowledging the reality. Yeah, this is bad, but, and this is how we're going to navigate through it. And really, truth be told, that sort of approach would really make you stand out in the crowd. It would be unique. <laughs> yes. Because uh, it, it's so easy to go the other direction. It's uh, so easy. So many do. So easy. Well, I sure appreciate the time you invested in preparing this today to, to share this additional wealth of information. And I know how you love coming through research and coming up with great examples for us. And, the, and these were all very, very good. I appreciate everybody being able to join us today. Uh, one of my favorite quotes on this topic is from David Brinkley, who is a television journalist. A successful man is one who can lay a firm foundation with the bricks that others have thrown at him. So <laughs> taking what others may throw to you as a leader and turning it into something positive. Uh, be a good foundation for the work that we do, our organizations, our employers. And uh, Pam's presentation today sure had relevant topics for the times that we're in. So appreciate that. We can stay on and, and visit a little bit if some of you uh, have questions or want to include questions in the chat. We're always glad to to have that feedback and visit some more if you need to. Otherwise, thank you for joining us today.